This is Going Under, Anesthesia Answered with Dr. Brian Schmutzler. I'm Vahid Sadrzadeh, your host, and of course, I act as the patient, and our residing physician acts as the residing physician. Yes, that's right. That's Dr. Right. Brian Schmutzler, of course, here to answer your questions. Uh, questions you have from all over social media you sent them in and we're here to dive in uh with the good doc here in just a few minutes but we always start our podcast with a pressing topic and maybe a question that you want to dive in a little more uh and, and maybe don't have uh, the time um literal time that they provide on social media correct <laughs> per video to answer uh some of those questions uh so let's start the podcast off uh, this time brian this is episode four and in this one we want to talk about the types of anesthesia and examples of their uses so for somebody like me who really doesn't know a lot about anesthesia i didn't really know there's different types of anesthesia so uh and, and this does this have to do with the, the local anesthetic and, you know, putting me completely under or different types of drugs that you use for anesthesia? Uh, both, really. Um, and and so, so some of the drugs we use for certain types can also be used for other types. Um, and so hopefully people can understand after the, they hear this, this episode that we don't just go in and go to sleep, right? That's not the way that it works. There's, there's several different types of anesthetics. We can, we can sort of start talking about all the different types. You, you've got general anesthetics, which is what people think of going off to sleep. And so we've got a couple different types that we can do there. Then we've got monitored anesthesia care, which is sort of a lower level type anesthesia where you're asleep, but not totally asleep. People sometimes call it twilight sedation. So we'll get into that. And then there's regional anesthesia, uh, which is nerve blocks. And so, um, and, and we can break each one of those down into different ways that we do things. Um, and so I, I guess we'll just start with general anesthesia. So general anesthesia is what people classically think of. You go in, they say count down from 10, you go off to sleep, you wake up later. At three. Uh, yeah, I'm always uh, gone by three. <laughs> or, or not. Yeah, they, yeah some, or people not, <laughs> some people don't even count. Um, so, so general anesthesia is basically rendering a patient completely unaware of what's going on, full anesthetic, totally asleep, Oftentimes, we put in some sort of airway device for this. Essentially, almost always, we put in an airway device for this. So that this would be for a procedure, you're going to have your gallbladder out. Um, I'm just thinking of common things sure. here. Uh, you're going to have your appendix out. Um, you're going to have open heart surgery, that sort of stuff. So bring the patient to the operating room, help them fall off to sleep through the IV usually. Propofol is probably the most common anesthetic that we use for induction, the, the time when we put a patient to sleep. And then we keep them to sleep through their airway, whichever airway we choose. And so we'll, we'll break this down into general anesthesia with an endotracheal tube and general anesthesia with an LMA. So general anesthesia with an endotracheal tube means that we give the anesthetic to get them to sleep. We give another medication that will prevent them from moving their muscles at all. And then we put an endotracheal tube, which is... Uh, just a small plastic tube that goes down through the trachea, through the windpipe, uh, through the vocal cords, and all the way down to, to the first part of the bronchus, the first part of the lungs there. Um, and, and so we don't go all the way into the lungs, but we go right above where the, where the lungs split. Um, and so that, that's general anesthesia with an endotracheal tube. We keep patients asleep then with, with the volatile anesthetics, with gases that go in and out, um, and then wake them up at the end. So that's that's kind of what you think of classically as your as your main anesthetic. And what type of I mean, is there one main drug used for that that you always use for general anesthetic or anesthesia? Yeah. So there's multiple phases to an anesthetic, um, and this is something you learn kind of as you start anesthesia. There's the induction phase, the maintenance phase, and the emergence phase. So the induction phase, yeah, we typically use similar anesthetics. And, and one thing I wanted to point out, you know, we were talking before we we started the podcast. We individualize our anesthetics, right? So we have a, a general guideline of what we think we're going to do for anesthesia, but each patient gets a little bit different anesthetic than the other one based on what sure. the procedure is, their comorbidities, how sensitive the patient is to their medications, that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, so we have like a, a basic set of medications that we'll use for the induction phase going to sleep, and then a set of medications that we use for the maintenance phase, which is what you asked. These are volatile anesthetics or inhaled anesthetics. They're gases that go from the machine through the endotracheal tube into the lungs, into the bloodstream, and then eventually when you stop giving them, they come out of the lungs, out of the bloodstream, into the lungs, 
out of the lungs back into the uh, back into the the machine. Um, you know, there's three or four of them that are available. Most anesthesia providers will use a, a medication called sevoflurane. So again, it's just an inhaled anesthetic, sort of a derivative of ether. And if you guys have heard of ether in the past, mm-hmm. um, and so that's that's an older. Uh, or chloroform is another one that they used to use a long time ago. But yeah, mostly now we use sevoflurane. There's also isoflurane and desflurane, which are two other sort of cousins of, of sevoflurane. And then there's the emergent fa- emergence phase, which is where we allow the medications to wear off, um, to exit the body in whatever ways they're going to exit the body to get processed. Uh, and then if we've used a medication that causes the muscles not to work, a paralytic, then we'll give a reversal for that. Okay. And, and, uh- Going into some detail here, depending on the height, weight of the patient, how do you figure out the timing, right? So, like, yeah. d- do you do you give them the, you know, this um, an- anesthetic, and it's time-based, right? So, like, why do I always wake up perfectly, like... You know, w- well, when I go into the uh, practice, right? So, so, so if if you that's, like perfectly that's, meaning like in a perfect time, 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 right. time frame, yeah. So, so it it takes some skill to know how to get the anesthetic to wear off at the right time, and you learn that you know. Over, sure, I I probably done fifteen thousand cases by now, right? So my first thousand probably weren't timed as well as my last 14,000. Um, it also depends who you work with, right? Sure. So so it's easier for me when I'm working with someone that I've worked with for 10 years. I know when they get to a certain phase in their procedure, that's when I'm turning the gas off because I've done it with them uh, 3,000 okay. times. Sure. Um, and, and so, yeah, so a lot of it is just timing, paying attention to what's going on, seeing when, you know, based on your past experience with that particular case and that particular surgeon, when to turn the gas off to let it, to let it di- dissipate so that the patient wakes up. Um, there is a, a pretty good window. Um, you know, if I, turn, if I turn the gas off now versus five minutes from now, the patient's probably going to wake up in a pretty similar time frame. If I turn the gas off now versus 30 minutes from now, it's going to be a much more delayed emergence. So how, as an example, like yeah. how many minutes before the surgery is done, do you turn that off? It depends. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> depends on the patient. Depends on the procedure. Um, you know, I don't remember all the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. You just get a sense sure. of, of when to turn it off. You know, I would say in general, um, as a uh, surgeon, let's say for a, a belly procedure, it, as a surgeon is starting to close the skin, I can probably turn the gas all the way off, but I'll have turned it down. Again, it depends on the surgeon. So uh, I, I know that a surgeon that I work with, as soon as the gallbladder is out, I know, let's say it's 15 minutes till they get to the skin and then another three minutes from when they get to the skin to when they're totally done. So, you know, and, and I'm not thinking that you know, consciously. It's just I remember that from every other time that I've worked with that surgeon. Turn that gas off at this point when I work with that surgeon um, or turn it down at this point and off at this point. So there's some art to it. I mean, that's what we call the art of medicine, but there's certainly some art to it. How do you, I mean, uh, the obvious answer here is they live through the procedure, right? (laughs) But how do you measure success like quantitatively or qualitatively, right? Like, well, how do you, as you go from a thousand to 2000 to 5,000 to 10,000 cases, what is the measure of success that you use per patient and, and how do you go back and, you know, like as, as a TV personality or, or TV anchor, I go back and watch my work. Yeah. How, you know, how, how do you do that? How do you measure success? Yeah. So, so a successful anesthetic, I mean, the, the main thing is that they wake up with no right. complications, right? I mean, that's, a, that's the obvious one. Right. Um, a smooth emergence, meaning that they're not coughing a bunch, that they, you know, my, probably my, my um, most kind of glamorous anesthetics are when the surgeon's still in the room, the patient opens their eyes, I take the tube out, and they there's no coughing, nothing, and the patient just looking around, super happy, right? So does that happen every time? No, but right. that's always the goal. So the, patients aren't coughing when they wake up, patients don't have severe pain when they wake up, and, and you can just tell, if you've been in the operating room long enough, you can tell a smooth emergence 
from a not smooth emergence. Um, that's really why, and we didn't get into this yet, so this is a good good time maybe to get into it. There's another type of airway called an LMA or laryngeal mask airway. Not appropriate for every procedure. We don't typically paralyze patients, so you know we wouldn't do an open belly case with this type of type of airway, um, and we wouldn't do anything prone, meaning where the the patient is on their belly instead of on their back with this type of airway. But the advantage of a laryngeal mask airway is that. I can put that in after the patient's asleep and I can take it out while they're still asleep. So okay. we, we keep patients breathing on their own with the, the LMA. And so we pull that out while they're still asleep and then they wake up very slowly on their own and they're not choking on a, mm. on a tube that's in their mouth. They're not biting on it. Basically they just wake up as at their own pace, but there's nothing irritating that, their airway. So those those are probably the, the most smooth emergence uh, is with an LMA where we can pull it out while they're still asleep. So uh, in terms of uh, other types and other examples of uses, um, you know, we've talked about general anesthetic and uh, I guess the uh, another one is local, right? Yep. Yeah. So we're not really involved in local anesthesia. Um, you know. So, so this would be, for instance, if uh, you know, probably the, one of the most common things is is uh, a toe amputation by a podiatrist. They'll put a little bit of local anesthesia in themselves. We won't be involved in that mm. at all. Um, if you're talking about using local anesthesia from an anesthetic anesthesia provider point of view, then you're talking about a regional anesthetic. Okay. And so we can break regional anesthesia basically down into two types. You've got neuraxial anesthesia, which is epidurals and spinals. So that's putting numbing medicine in the spine and getting patients numb, you know, their entire trunk numb or uh -huh. their trunk all the way down to their legs numb. Um, and so we use that for total joints, so total knees and total hips, where we replace those. We use that for uh, C-sections. We use that for labor. We'll put an epidural in for labor. Uh, sometimes we'll use it for urology procedures where they're working on the, on the groin area. Um, and so that, that's one type of regional anesthesia. Then we've got peripheral nerve blocks. That's kind of the other big, big thing. And so we'll use that for a lot of different procedures. There's not a lot of times we use peripheral nerve blocks as the main anesthetic. We'll often combine that with another type of anesthetic. Um, when it comes to neuraxial, an neuraxial anesthesia, we use that as the main anesthetic a lot of times. C-sections in particular, just get a spinal block for that or epidurals for labor. Um, so overall, you know, the, the, those are the two types of, of neuraxial anesthesia. Peripheral nerve blocks, there's thousands at this point. Um, you know, kind of the main ones that people know about. Uh, if you have a shoulder done, we'll do an interscaling nerve block. If you have a knee done, we'll do an adequate canal block. Um, and I think we're going to get to maybe some questions later about uh, regional anesthesia. But there's certainly things we do in the foot where we'll do a popliteal nerve block. Um, and then, you know, there's these all these new newer truncal blocks. So blocks that go in the belly or the back, um, erector spinae plane blocks, tap blocks are a big one, or transverse abdominis plane blocks. So we've got a whole cadre. And and you really have to know the anatomy and the physiology as well as the, as the ultrasound anatomy to be able to, to do these blocks, the correct block for the correct procedure. So I'm going to do a shameless plug yeah. on your Patreon page because, uh, you know, I've, I've sat in on a few of these blocks and um, it, they don't take a ton of time. No, no. But you're pretty precise when you go in yep. to know exactly, uh, you know, what you're doing and how you're doing it. So you, you're educating other, you know, anesthesia providers, providers yeah. and students yep. on some of these blocks. Talk about that. And, um, you know, it's a good chance to talk about your Patreon page and sure. what you're doing there. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so a, a big part of, um, my practice is doing regional anesthesia and I, and I come from a background, which we, I think we've talked about in another podcast. Um, my, my, PhD research was all about uh, conversion, the, the mechanisms of conversion of acute pain to chronic pain. And so to me, ever since I was a medical student, to me, it just didn't make sense to use a bunch of opioids to treat pain. Uh, I was a medical student, you know, back before the opioid crisis became quite as... Um, as relevant and, and, and in the public eye as it is now. And even then I was saying things like, why are we, why are we giving patients opioids? They don't treat the problem. They just make patients not care. Um, and so there's, and this is maybe a little bit outside the scope of what we're talking about today, but uh, there's, there's really neuropathic pain and inflammatory pain and opioids treat neither. So, 
so um, for me, it's always been sort of a passion of mine, and I've been involved in multiple, um, you know, uh, nonprofits and organizations talking about, you know, preventing opioid use and chronic pain and that sort of stuff. Um, so, so for me, it's a, it's a passion to treat pain with regional anesthesia. And so I, I, I was well-trained in it. Um, I did some extra training in it and then I've really kept up on it. And so I've been asked by companies, multiple mm -hmm. companies to go out and teach regional anesthesia to other providers. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, part of that is, you know, I travel some and do that, but my hope was with the Patreon page to be able to teach other anesthesia providers without them or me having to go anywhere. Right. So they can, they can see what we're doing. They can log on and then, you know, uh, subscribe to the Patreon page. And then I can even answer questions if they have a question. Hey, why did you do it this way versus this way? Or, um, you know, how long did it take you to figure out how to do that block? Um, and I, I stay up on all the research um, and I teach myself a lot of new blocks. I mean, when I, when I came out, I probably had an armament of 30 regional anesthesia blocks and now I probably have 60. So I've taught myself a lot of these blocks uh, just reading other people's research and, and figuring out how to do things. Um, yeah, so that that's my shameless plug for, for no, Patreon. No, that's it, it's and it's a, it's a great tool yeah. uh, for those providers again to have somebody who has over fifteen thousand hours yeah. or a, way over yeah, procedures, yeah, probably more than that when it yeah, comes to regional way anesthesia. Over, yeah, way uh, over for uh, regional anesthesia uh, to provide some of those things, so you can catch them. It's Dr. Brian Schmutzler on Patreon, and there's just a small fee, and of course that helps with everything that you're doing, right. you know, to put on those blocks and to put on this podcast right. uh, helps with some of those uh, costs. But really, it's great information for those providers. And you can go to that page uh, and check it out uh, today. But you you do those, uh, you focus on some of those areas. What are some of the areas that you tend to focus on the most that you may have the most experience with? Yeah, um, so uh, I, I guess sort of I'm I'm known in the regional anesthesia world for erector spinae plane blocks. That's something I picked up when it first came out. Um, I did a lot of procedures with a breast surgeon, and so we were doing one of the older blocks called a paravertebral block, which worked fairly well, but had some inherent risks with it, and and had some some technical difficulties, particularly in patients who were a little bit bigger. And so I, I was a very early adopter of the erector spinae plane block, which turned out to be a block that can be used for a lot of different procedures. So <clears throat> that's that's probably one of the blocks that I'm I'm most um, sort of facile with and has a lot of a lot of potential uses. Uh, then you know I do a lot of orthopedics, and so we we do a lot of these orthopedic blocks that a lot of other places are doing, although we kind of do things a little bit differently. We do a lot of blocks for total knee replacements, mm -hmm. uh, but we do a combination of an adductor canal block, an IPAC block, which is a little bit newer block, and then genicular nerve blocks, which are even sort of newer when it comes to doing acute pain for chronic, uh, for, uh, acute pain for, uh, for total knees. We do fascia iliaca blocks and fascia lata blocks for total hips. So we do a lot of those. And then your classic upper extremity blocks will do interscaling blocks, uh, we'll do supraclavicular blocks, and then oftentimes we'll add sort of some extra blocks either in the armpit or in the chest, pex blocks or isolated ulnar nerve blocks for some of our, our other procedures. So we, we really try to think about the best way and the anatomy and the physiology of the procedure and the block so that we, we do the, the most amount of pain relief uh, for these procedures, even if it's not necessarily something that everybody's doing. Um, we, we try to just stay on, on top of how to make it the best experience for the patients. I guess episode four is the shameless plug episode because <laughs> a shameless plug for a guy that you work with a lot and, uh, you know, a friend of ours, Dr. Adam C. Yes, yes. Uh, who's an orthopedic surgeon yeah. uh, here in the area. But mm -hmm. um, I know you guys work, ex you know, together and have done probably thousands of cases yeah. together oh, as yeah. well. But he does the total hips, the total knees. He does, yeah. And, and whenever we talk to a patient, um, listen, I've been in the room for those, right? Those aren't pleasant. <laughs> you know, I, I'm just going to be honest. Um, uh, I'm not looking forward to mine in yeah, 10 years. Yeah. So I'm just saying like, it, it doesn't look pleasant, but they're always waking up and saying, listen, I have no pain. Yeah. Yep. I have zero pain. And for a procedure like that to have zero pain is probably quite a compliment to the surgeons that are working, uh, the surgeon and to and the anesthesiologist anesthesia, yeah. that's working on the case. Yeah. It, it's a lot has changed in the last I mean, since I've been in practice 
10, 12 years, um, we used to do things. We used to just put patients to sleep basically for, for a total knee or a total hip. They would wake up with a lot of pain. They wouldn't be able to do physical therapy. They wouldn't be able to, to cognitively be there to do what they needed to do. Um, we've changed over time. And now Adam, Dr. Sand and I have, have sort of these protocols in place when we work together. Um, he's very forward with allowing us to do whatever blocks we think are best. And I think most of the surgeons I work with now trust me enough to, to let me do whatever blocks we think are best. But um, so we, we do that whole complement of blocks for his total knees, whole complement of blocks for his total hips. And then we add, you know, doing a spinal for the anesthetic in the operating room. And then the, the final thing we'll talk about is the monitor anesthesia care or MAC. So we will give the sedation in the operating room as well. Honestly, for those cases, the sedation is just so the patient doesn't hear anything. Mm. We could do, if you said to me, hey, I want my total knee done and I want to be totally awake the whole time, I could do it because the spinal block is the anesthetic in the operating room and the nerve block is the anesthetic. You'll feel the thing, but you're going to hear everything. But you'll hear everything, yeah. And so, and so they're, you know, they're a little... They seem, they're a little barbaric, right? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of power tools, hammering, sawing, that sort of stuff. I just stuff, don't so. know if I, yeah. if I didn't have a stomach for that. Yeah, but I mean, it, you certainly, if, if you were high risk, if, if yeah. I, you know, if I looked at you and I said, if I give you any sedation at all, you could die. We could do the anesthetic without any sedation and you, you'd be able to tolerate it. Have you ever had somebody ask for that? Yeah, um, I mean, we have people ask for it because they want to see things. Um, I, don't, I don't typically... Uh, you, you just, I don't typically honor that. Yeah. They, they don't, I mean, most patients don't, even though they think they want to see it and hear it, they, they probably don't. Um, I, I've never had a patient so sick that I couldn't give them some, some yeah. anesthetic. So, all right, let's, um, that's, I always learn something yeah. here on this podcast and that's the hope, right? Is that we're learning something. Yeah. It's uh, anesthesia answered. It's going under with Dr. Brian Schmutzler and we've gotten to the uh, we've arrived at the Q and A portion of our podcast, the, which we always do. Do you want to get some? Yeah, yeah, the one the one thing we missed was monitored okay. anesthesia care. That's essentially giving medications. There's a whole spectrum that from from you know um, essentially conscious sedation, moderate sedation, deep sedation, and, and monitored anesthesia care. Essentially, all that means is we're giving medications through the IV to keep patients sleepy enough to tolerate a procedure, but we're not putting an endotracheal tube in there. You know, if I were to, you know. Um, pinch you, you would, you would notice it, you would wake up, but it's enough anesthetic to, for them to tolerate a procedure. So just, just to, to finish off so that we kind of tie Put it all together. It. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's, it's really interesting uh, stuff. Again, I didn't really know that you guys, you know, the, this scope, yeah. right. Of, of what you're doing on a day in day out basis. All right. So our questions are from viewers like you, listeners like you that uh, subscribe, um, hopefully subscribe to uh, Brian's YouTube page and his social media channels, Instagram mainly and TikTok. And of course, huge on Facebook as well. So if you have a question there, put it down in the comments below or just send him a message. Uh, he reads all of them. So if you can uh, do that, uh, we will read it on the air here on our podcast. Uh, the first question, Brian, is having to do with what we talked about. Have you ever done a nerve block for an Achilles tendon surgery? If so, how long should it last before it wears off? What type of meds are used in, well, that specific nerve block, let's say? Yeah, so that's a, that's a pretty in-depth question. Um, we do a decent amount of, of podiatry and foot and ankle surgery in a lot of my practices. And so usually what we do for an Achilles tendon procedure is what's called a popliteal nerve block. Essentially what that is, that's blocking the sciatic nerve. Everybody kind of has heard of sciatica, that pain that goes down the backside of your leg. It's a big nerve. Um, you block that nerve and you get you get about 75 or 80 percent of the lower leg covered with that. Um, if there's anything happening on the medial side, so on the middle side of, of the ankle or, or the lower leg, we'll add an adductor canal block, which is one of those blocks that we do uh, for, for total knees. Um, yeah, so, so we do a, a popliteal block for that. Um, I mean, if, if you want my cocktail, typically I use half percent ropivacaine plain for that block. Uh, for a popliteal block, I'll put anywhere from 20 to 30 mLs, milliliters of, of, of half percent ropivacaine there. How long does that last? That's a great question. So it's super variable, particularly with that block. The sciatic nerve is a big, big nerve, all right? and it's got a lot of smaller sort of nerve fascicles inside that nerve. And if, if you're watching, you can see I'm sort of doing some hand motions here, but it's a big nerve. And so as that local anesthetic, that ropivacaine penetrates that nerve, it gets in there and sometimes it takes a while for it to get out. Uh, and so, you know, I have people who say, hey, it lasted 18 hours. And then I have people who say it lasted four or five days. 
I usually don't get concerned if that nerve block is lasting four or five days. If you get past seven days, that's when I that's when I have some concern that there may be some damage in there. Uh, at that point, it's considered a paresthesia. Uh, and, and so at that point, I would go back and either see your anesthesia provider or see your surgeon and let them know that the the uh, the anesthetic is the, the local anesthetic is still working that you still got numbness so uh, our next question is a very short one but uh, <laughs> what is the main use of ketamine uh, so so ketamine is what uh, has been traditionally been called the uh, what do they say the perfect anesthetic or the or the um, the the most complete anesthetic. So it it treats it, it gives you sedation, okay? It gives you anesthesia, so where you don't know what's going on, and it gives you analgesia, pain relief. Um, the the problem with ketamine is it takes a lot of it to be a true anesthetic, uh, and it it's not a perfect pain reliever, um, and then it's not a perfect sedative either. And so there's a, there's a few things in there that, that, that cause a bit of an issue with ketamine. Um, probably the main issue with ketamine is that a lot of times adults will get what's called a, essentially it's called a bad trip, right? It's, so if you, if you don't give a pre-medication with a benzodiazepine, like, like Burr said, a lot of times patients who get ketamine will have a, a bad experience with it. They'll, they'll not not get, just get the sedation and that that good experience from it, but a bad experience where they feel unsafe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so that's one of the reasons we don't always use ketamine. Um, it takes a decent amount to give you really good pain relief, and at that point you're getting sort of into the anesthetic realm. So um, it's not perfect there either, uh, and it, and it's not perfect um, in terms of the fact that it it causes secretions. So if you just give a patient ketamine without anything else, they're going to get a lot of secretions in their mouth. Sometimes that doesn't really matter, but sometimes it does. Um, and, and so that, that's, that's the reason we don't use it all the time. Um, usually we use ketamine as an adjunct to other anesthetics. So we'll give it sometimes for a patient who has chronic pain because it's another way to treat the pain. We'll give it for somebody who might have a problem with a medication like propofol because propofol causes the blood pressure to drop. Ketamine, if you add it, will cause the blood pressure to go up. So it sort of offsets. Mm, so it okay. gives you that sedative effect, but also causes the blood pressure to go up. So the, the, we use it as an adjunct, but usually not as the main anesthetic. All right. Uh, our next question is, uh, can a longer duration of anesthesia cause some memory loss? I had two surgeries with more than 10 anesthesia. Okay. Um, interesting. Uh, yeah. So I always tell patients that anesthesia is not without risk, right? And the longer you're under anesthesia, the more risk there is. Um, so yeah, certainly more anesthetic is going to go to your brain the longer the anesthesia occurs. There's a lot of debate in the literature as to uh, a, a normal healthy patient who doesn't have cognitive defects to begin with is at very low risk for long-term effects of the anesthesia. Somebody who's got pre-existing cognitive defects is at high risk for, for long-term effects of the anesthesia. But certainly that those long-term effects are dose-dependent, meaning that the longer you're under anesthesia, the more likely you are to have those effects. If you had a, I'm assuming you meant 10 hours. So if you had a 10-hour anesthetic, um, you're likely to have some longer-term effects. It may not be permanent. It just may take a few weeks or months for that anesthetic to, to sort of get out of your system where you're not having cognitive issues. All right. Well, thank you for those questions. We're going to cap it there. And then, uh, of course, we want uh, we have plenty of questions to answer um, in future shows here. Obviously, this is only season one. Yeah. Can't wait till we take live calls oh, yeah. Yeah, from our viewers and our listeners. We'll get to that, I'm sure, at some point. But, um, you know, if there's nothing else you want to add about the topic here and about some of these questions... I think we can wrap. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it was a good good session today. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks so much, Dr. Brian Schmutzler. And you can, of course, check him out on his social channels, uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, he's on YouTube, Patreon now. Mm -hmm. Again, we talked about some of those uh, regional blocks, mm -hmm. and you can catch those. Again, we'll link it below in the description here on YouTube and on uh, wherever you get your podcasts. We appreciate you listening. Uh, this is uh, Going Under, Anesthesia Answered with Dr. Brian Schmutzer. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. Thanks.